I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Today we want to look at verses 14 to 22. The title of this message is Dining with Demons, something you do not want to do. Dining with demons, and yet this is a very real and present danger, not only in Paul's day, but in this day as well. I want to begin by reading the passage beginning in verse 14, and I trust that the Lord will give us understanding today of what Paul is saying, really what God is saying through his mouthpiece, Paul, and what the implications of this are for our own spiritual lives. Beginning in verse 14, Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I say as to wise men, you judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we share a blessing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. Look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we not, are we not stronger than He? Are we? This past week, I drove to Nashville for my annual physical exam, and passing through Montgomery and heading up to Birmingham, I saw on the right of the highway this funny sign that's been there ever since I've been here in Alabama. I'm sure many of you have seen it too. The sign has a picture of the devil with a pitchfork on it, and the sign says, go to church or the devil will get you. Now, I've seen that sign for many years, and I'll tell you what I've often thought based upon some churches I've been in. Go to church and the devil will get you. The fact is, just because someone is in church does not mean they are exempt from Satan. In fact, I will go so far as to say that the most dangerous place to be is in a worship setting in which the truth is not being made known by God. I think it is far more dangerous than even being in a house of ill repute where only your body is being soiled. But to be in a worship setting where the truth about God and salvation is withheld from the people, that soils not the body but the soul and the spirit, and it affects not merely temporal outcome but eternal outcome. But what is far worse, according to this passage, is that when one is in a setting in which there is worship, in which there is allegiance given to a God, and one is participating in that service, they are opening themselves up to the activities of Satan, and they are flirting with demons. That is what Paul is saying in this passage, that it is a very dangerous thing to place yourself in a worship context, in a religious context in which there is false worship through false teaching of false gods. It is not an innocent thing. It is not 
merely a, a neutral experience, but that there is a fellowship and a partnership that one steps into with the demons that are behind that false teaching and the demons that are behind that false truth. Paul says in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 that there are doctrines of demons and there are seducing spirits. And every false religion ha has been conspired by demons. And every false teaching and every false worship of the one true living God, behind all of it, the architect is the father of all lies, none other than Satan himself, John 8, verse 44. And so what Paul is addressing here with the Corinthians is very simply this. They have been saved out of paganism. They have been saved out of raw idolatry. And now that they are in Christ, now that they are the people of God, and now that they understand that they have liberty in Christ to partake of certain activities, the Corinthians are pushing the fences out to the very limit and beyond the very limit. And they are presuming upon God. And they are indulging themselves in their liberties and in their freedoms to do whatever they want to do as if there are no consequences for their own spiritual lives. And the fact of the matter is there, there were enormous spiritual consequences that were negative in the lives of the Corinthians as they pursued certain liberties. And they were actually going back into pagan temples, pagan worship houses in which there was idolatry. And they were doing it for social reasons and to be a part of their old network of friends and to be uh, connected with uh, the people of the town. And they presumed that it was a very innocent thing. And they did not want to, to break off all of their associations and all of their friendships with those with which they once had fellowship with. And so they were coming back into these pagan worship houses and they were involved in these pagan services that actually uh, there, were, there were sacrifices that were being offered to pagan gods. And they were eating of this bread in their own hearts and in their, their own minds. They are saying, we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we, are, we, we are in Christ. And so for them, it was not a matter of, of truly abandoning Christ or forsaking Christ and, and going back to the world. What they wanted was a syncretistic approach where they could have one foot in their Christian fellowship and one foot back in their old pagan fellowship and, and be at home in either setting in which they found themselves. And as they were going back to their old pagan friends, and as they were going back to their old pagan context in which they were participating in these services, Paul must address them very directly. And he will speak matter of frank. In fact, Paul will command them to get out of those places and to forsake these pagan temples because they are endangering their own spiritual health and vitality, to say nothing of the compromise of their witness and their testimony. They're not in those temples to win people to Christ. They're not in those temples to stand up and say, this is all a sham. This is all idolatry. This is all a, a desecration of the one true living God. No, they weren't going back into these temples and saying that. They were just blending in with everybody else and, and, and just going with the flow and going along with this. And in so doing, Paul says to them, you are very naive in your spiritual life. You do not understand what you are now exposing yourself to. 
you do not understand the dangers for your soul. And there was no danger for them to lose their salvation. We are eternally secure in Christ. There is no way that once they are truly saved that they could ever fall from grace. But as those who are held in the palm of God's hand, they nevertheless can place themselves in very slippery places and fall into influences that are satanic and demonic. Uh, This may sound somewhat sensational to us. Uh, This may sound somewhat uh, over the top. But Paul tells it like it is, and perhaps it reveals something of our own naivety regarding exposure to that which comes from the kingdom of darkness. Now, I do not think that this is saying that, for example, you could not, uh, that, that we cannot be with sinners. Let's just start with the most obvious point. Jesus was the friend of sinners. Uh, Jesus spent time with tax collectors and sinners. This is not saying that we are to with, withdraw from the world and we all uh, go by land someplace and we live in a Christian commune and, and just have our own little holy huddle. That's not what this is teaching or saying. We are to go into the world. We are to penetrate the world. We are to, to take the gospel to the world. And that means we must rub shoulders with those who are unconverted, and who are unsaved. And neither is this saying that we cannot ever uh, attend a wedding service, for example, that would be held in uh, some place that where the gospel is not being preached and honored. Uh, I do think it would be terribly wrong to regularly attend such a place that desecrates the true saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But just to simply uh, attend a a service in which you are not a participant, uh, in which you are just an observer, I don't think that in and of itself means that you have violated what Paul is warning about here. But what he is saying is that if we allow ourselves to be in certain settings, uh, be they church, be they religious, be they social, uh, be they cultural, in which there is a religious context, in which there is the recognition of God, small g, and we participate in that setting, whether it be a place where there is a, a, where it's a church, where there is a false gospel, that there is a denial of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is a place that preaches another Jesus and another gospel. That is a damning gospel that says you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Uh, That says you have to take the Mass in order to be saved that says you have to worship saints in order to be saved, etc., etc., then according to this text, you are exposed to the demons who are the architects of this false teaching, and there will be serious consequences for your own soul. That is what Paul is warning. And, And as he issues this warning... There's not a a middle ground on this. It's an either-or, as he will speak very directly and very frankly. Now, let us understand this by way of introduction. Satan longs to be worshipped. That was his original sin in heaven. He once was Lucifer, the son of the morning. He was created as the highest of, of all of the angels. He was the the archangel. He had closest access to God. In the hierarchy of angelic beings, he was the highest of all of the angels. He was over the other angels. And in his close proximity to God, he demanded to be worshipped. He wanted to elevate 
himself above the throne of God because as he looked around and as he saw the myriads and myriads of the angelic beings worship God, he became drunk with his own pride and envy and he wanted to be worshipped by the other angels rather than to simply be the orchestrator of worship from the angels to God. And so iniquity was found in his heart. And he sought to elevate himself because he is a madman who wanted to be worshipped. And God cast him down, down to the earth. And with him, he cast a third of the angels. Lucifer was so persuasive that even in the immediate presence of God, he was able to convince a third of the angelic beings, one out of every three, to worship him rather than to worship God. That's how shrewd, how cunning, and how diabolical the devil is. And he convinced a third of the angels to join in this rebellion against God and to put their worship and their adoration in him. And now Satan has been cast down to the earth and a third of the angels. And now as he is carrying out his schemes of darkness upon the earth, perhaps his most dark and devilish desire is he still desires to be worshipped. He still desires to be the object of adoration and affection from those who have been created in the image of God. And there is a desire in his part to steal away worship from the one true living God, just as he did in heaven, and to direct it all to himself. And so he carries this out in so many different ways here upon the earth. And he has conspired false religions. And he is the one who stands behind every single one of these false religions. He and his demons around the world, and as false religions worship that God, small g, they are in reality offering their worship to these demons and to Satan himself. And they are entering into a diabolical partnership with these demons. Uh, they are naive of this and they are innocent of, not innocent, they are ignorant of this. But that is the fact of the matter. And they are dining with demons, if you will. And Satan has also invaded the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, church, quote, unquote, and has corrupted the gospel and has diverted men away from the truth of God, such that in many places, as Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2, your church is nothing but a synagogue of Satan. It is a synagogue of Satan because Satan is the one who is receiving the worship and the adoration in these houses of lies. And so all of that must be taken into account as we look at this passage. That these naive, shallow, superficial believers in Corinth, uh, these carnal believers, are going back into these pagan temples where Satan is reigning, where demons are present. And they are participating in these services. And as such, they are subjecting their very soul to the influences of Satan himself. Could anything be more dangerous? Could anything be more treacherous for one's soul than to enter into direct contact with demons? To enter into direct contact fellowship with and partnership with evil spirits, I think we would be hard-pressed to come up with a greater danger. So as we look at these verses, I want to set before you an outline, and I want to work our way through this. 
I want you to note in verse 14 and 15 the command against idolatry. And then in verses 16 through 20, the communion within idolatry. There is a communion within idolatry, and it's not with God. It is with Satan. And then I want you to note with me the contradiction of idolatry, verse 21. And then finally, the condemnation of idolatry in verse 22. Now, let's begin with the command against idolatry, which begins in verse 14, and there's no small talk here by Paul. Paul cuts to the chase. I mean, when someone's about to be run over by a train, it's no time for a filibuster. When someone is drowning, it's no time for a lesson on how to, how to swim or keep your nostrils above water. It is time for dramatic intervention. And that is what Paul does here. We'll talk about it later. He gives some explanation. But he says in verse 14, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Stop flirting with it. Flee from it. Uh, to, to flee from it means to, to bolt, to, to run away from, from this practice. Uh, the word is used elsewhere in ancient literature uh, uh, of an army that's caught in an ambush. And before it is massacred and slaughtered, to, to run away, to escape the danger. That is the very word that is used here. And Paul is saying, flee for your life. Avoid this completely. Now, when Paul says idolatry here, he is referring to the worldly practice that the Corinthians have become involved with, namely attending idol feasts and eating idol food in these pagan temples in this religious context. The Corinthians, it's unthinkable, but they were actually going back into the pagan temples and attending these, these feasts, these festive uh, settings, and eating the, the idle food. And Paul says that this is not simply border on idolatry, it is idolatry. And he says you've got to, to stop, to flee. I want you to note it's an imperative command. It's not a suggestion. He's not trying to simply win them over. He's actually commanding them by apostolic authority. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have absolutely no business whatsoever to be a part of these pagan feasts, period, paragraph, under this, the, the context and the circumstances in which you find yourself. And then he says, I speak as to wise men. Uh, he is saying that, acknowledging that they are saved. In verse 14, he calls them beloved. Here he speaks to them as wise men, meaning they have the Holy Spirit. They are indwelt by the Spirit of God. They have the Spirit as their teacher. They have received divine light and divine illumination and divine understanding that comes only from God. So in that sense... They are wise men. The fact of it is they're acting like fools, but they are actually wise men in that they have received the wisdom of God. And then he challenges them. He says, you judge what I say. As if to say, well, then you tell me if I'm right or wrong. You judge what I say. If you are truly wise, you will judge and know that what I am saying is true that you must stop your fraternizing with these idolaters in this idolatrous setting. If it costs you friendships, fine. If it costs you uh, business associates, fine. If it costs you uh, prestige in the world, then so be it. But you must recognize that this is a sin against Almighty God. It is a violation of the first and the second of the Ten Commandments. No doubt Paul was grieved as he learned this report of their participation in pagan feasts. That's where he once found them, 
when he first came to Corinth, when he preached the gospel. And they were lost. They were separated from God. They were aliens from the commonwealth of, of God. And under Paul's preaching, they came out of these licentious dens of iniquity. And they were like brands plucked out of the fire. And now Paul has left town. And he receives word that they're back in these pagan temples. As if they've never been saved to begin with. Beloved, let us understand that there are some places we ought not to be. He who would not fall down ought not to walk in slippery places. And there are some places that are off limits to us as children of God. It would be one thing if they were storming these temple, temples with gospel preachers to take over the service and stand up in front of everyone and to tell the truth about God and the gospel. But that's not why they're there. They're there just to blend in. They're there just to be a part. They are there just to go with the flow. They are there to be caught up in this thing. And Paul says, you're guilty of idolatry, and you need to flee from it. Now, I want you to note, second, the communion within idolatry. When I say the communion within idolatry, I think you'll note why I say that. The word communion means fellowship, partnership, a close, intimate relationship. And as you look at these next verses, I want you to see how many times that a word that is similar to communion is used. Uh, verse 16, notice, it's not the cup of blessing which we share, uh, which we bless a sharing. That word sharing comes from the Greek word koinonia, which means fellowship. It's the word that's used throughout the New Testament for the fellowship that we have with Christ and the fellowship that we have with one another in Christ. He repeats it at the end of verse 16. It's not the bread which we break, a sharing. There's that word communion, partnership, fellowship. And then in verse 17, he says, for we all partake of the one bread. That word partake, again, comes from the same uh, root word. Then verse 18, the word sharers. Are not all those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the... Uh, uh, in the altar, and there that word is used again. And so at the end of verse 20, I do not want you to become sharers in demons. It's the same word or the same, uh, from the same root word. And it is the idea of fellowship, to have intimate, personal communion with another in a, in a, close personal relationship with another. Uh, it speaks of being in alignment with and pulling in the same direction and to be exposed to the other person and to receive from that person who they are and what they are. So that's why I use this word. And as we begin to read verse 16, you, you should probably have this thought. What an odd place to begin a discussion of the Lord's Supper. And Paul is not mentioning the Lord's Supper in verses 16 and 17 to give us a theology of communion. Verse 16 and 17 are here as examples. And where this is headed is just as you have fellowship in a meal, in a religious worship setting, with the Lord who stands behind the bread and the, and the cup, and you have fellowship with one another, where this is headed, in like manner when you enter into false worship and participate in a false religious setting, you too are opening yourself up to demons and to Satan. So there's a parallelism that he is intending to set up here. That's why he talks about this in verse 16 and 17. 
So he asks two questions in verse 16 that expect an affirmative answer. It's not the cup of blessing which we bless, a blessing in the, uh, a sharing in the blood of Christ. He is saying when we come as a church to the Lord's table, there is a, a sharing that we enter into. We enter into a fellowship with Christ himself who stands behind the bread and the cup, and we have communion with Christ, who is the living Christ. It says, though we've come into his house, and he is the host and we are the guests, and he is sitting down with us, and he is presenting himself to us, and he is disclosing himself to us, and he is serving us, and we are having an even more intimate, close, personal communion with Christ than we do in other times and other places during the week. Further, we have a fellowship with one another. There is a unity in the body of Christ. And we draw near to one another as we draw near to the Lord. It's the old triangle uh, illustration that as I draw closer to the Lord and you draw closer to the Lord, that's where we are closest together. When I am away from the Lord, I can't be close to you. And when you're away from the Lord, lukewarm, then you can't be close to me experientially. We both must be in pursuit of drawing near to the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's only in Christ do we find our closest fellowship with one another. And by the way, that's why you should only marry a believer. You should only bear, marry another Christian because you can never be close to someone in a marriage situation in which that person is not truly drawing close to the Lord. If they have no relationship with the Lord, there is no way that you can have a real close relationship with them at the deepest level. It'll always be a a shallow, superficial marriage relationship that you'll have that'll be built on, on other things. And so he says in verse 16, is not the cup of blessing, referring to the cup that, our, that the Lord blessed when he gave it to his disciples in the upper room and inaugurated the, the Lord's Supper, he says, which we bless, meaning we give thanks to God when we take the cup as well. It is a sharing in the blood of Christ. It is a fellowship with Christ. It's not an empty ritual. It's not, a, it's not external religion. There is a true internal heart reality that you and I experience when we come to the Lord's table in the manner that the Lord prescribes. He then says in verse 16, is, is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ. He double reinforces it again, now talking about the breaking of, of the bread. And the point is the same. And there is this two-way fellowship that we enjoy. One vertical, the other horizontal. Vertical with the Lord, horizontal with the others who are in this service with us. And so Paul understands this general principle that when you come to the Lord's table and you come and take of the cup and take of the bread and you come in a worthy manner, you are entering into a yet more intimate fellowship and closer relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is, as it were, the host, and we are the guest in his home, as he is drawing near to us as we draw near to him. He then says in verse 17, as he continues to develop this, this illustration that he is giving, since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. That speaks of the of the horizontal fellowship within the body of Christ. There is a real sense of unity. 
But we were here last Sunday evening to take the Lord's Supper, and all of our deacons were seated on the front row and seated on the second row. And as we began that service, I actually said how close I feel to the body of Christ here at Christ Fellowship, how close in my heart I am to this body when we come to the Lord's table, and especially as the servants of this church sit together in a, in a statement of solidarity and closeness, it, it affects my heart. There is a, a real sense in which I draw nearer to them, and I trust that they are nearer to me than when we're out in the parking lot just talking about a football game. There is a deep sense of fellowship. There is unity. Uh, there is solidarity when we come to the Lord's table. And I want to say to those of you who do not come to the Lord's table in this church on the first Sunday evening of the month, you're out of fellowship unless you're providentially hindered. Like you can't walk to the car and can't turn on the key and get your car going and to come and be with the body of Christ when they gather around the Lord's table. And it amazes me. People come from Mississippi. They come from Florida. Uh, they come from a long distance away here in Alabama, and yet there are some of you who can't even get in a car and drive yourself here to have fellowship with the living Christ and to have fellowship with me and the others. Quite frankly, it's a very selfish thing on your part to withhold yourself from us and not give yourself to us and allow us to have the joy of, of fellowshipping with you and partnering with you. And Paul is acknowledging this sharing within the body of Christ when we come to the Lord's table. Now, having scolded some of you, rightly so, I do want to say this past Sunday evening, we had a wonderful turnout. And when I left here, my heart was filled to overflowing, and I thought, Lord, where else in the world would I want to be than with the people of God at Christ's fellowship as we come to the Lord's table and as we sing to the Lord and as we sit under the preaching of the Word of God and we enter into a very unique, intimate fellowship with Christ. And someone may say, well, I just have never have gone to church on Sunday night. Get over it. The body of Christ is meeting here on the first Sunday night of the month. Sixty minutes here is far better than watching 60 minutes there. So, let me continue. I hope you can hear the grass growing outside. Verse 18, Paul uses another example of when you sit down and have a meal with someone, there is this intimate fellowship, and it's true at the Lord's table. Of course, it's not true in your life if you don't come to the Lord's table. But he uses another illustration in verse 18. He says, look at the nation Israel. You can almost see him point if he were preaching. Look at the nation Israel. And when he says that, it's as though to say you will learn the very same truth if you will behold Israel. And as he points to Israel, he's pointing to Israel in their wilderness experience. At the time when they were in rebellion against God, at the time when they built or when they molded a golden calf and when they built an altar, and they had a meal. It was, an, it, it was a sex orgy is what it was. So in verse 18, look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifice sharers in the altar? And the word sharers, again, is the word for fellowship. It comes from koinonia. And this question anticipates a positive yes. Yes, those who eat food sacrificed on an altar are aligned with the deity represented in the altar, and they share in fellowship with that altar. 
I mean, when you come to that altar, something happens to you. Something invisible. Something supernatural. Something spiritual happens. No one just shows up. Now here he's talking about Israel in the wilderness. And in in Exodus 32, beginning in verse 1, we read how the people saw that Moses was delayed to come down from the mountain. He had been up on the mountaintop, Mount Sinai, for 40 days. They became impatient. And so they said to Aaron, Come, make us a god, small g. The word for God here, Elohim, could be translated God's plural and probably should be. Make us some gods who will go before us. And so Aaron caved in to this kind of congregational meeting. He caved in to the the insanity of their carnality. And he said, tear off the gold offerings. He said, oh, well, then let's take them an offering. And let's do it. And so the people began to put their gold rings uh, into the pot. And Aaron took it and fashioned it with a graven tool and made it into a molten calf. This molten calf is a young bull. And it's a throwback to their previous life in Egypt when they worship, when there, where there was the worship in Egypt of a god named Apis. Apis was the Egyptian fertility god. You can imagine all of the sexual uh, depravity that was involved in worshiping Apis. And the temple prostitutes and all that was involved. And so that's what Aaron made. And he said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. In verse 5, now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And in verse 6, we read that the people sat down to eat and to drink and to play. And the word for play here is uh, a euphemistic expression, sex play. To play, it refers to sex play. And what this had become was a drunken sexual orgy as they were worshiping this young bull who was the god of fertility in Egypt. And the parallel point that Paul is making you just can't come and sit down in front of this altar and be unaffected. You can't participate and enter in without it having a very significant effect upon your life. You're not that good to just sit there and be bulletproof. There is an influence. There is an effect that is coming upon you, and it is an influence and an effect that is supernatural that your eyes cannot see And there are demons behind this altar that are having an effect upon your mind more than you realize, an effect upon your heart more than you realize, an effect upon your will more than you realize. And in Deuteronomy 32, verse 17, Moses, when he gives the law the second time, he actually says it that when they came to the base of Mount Sinai and when they built this calf, They actually were having fellowship with demons. Demons, these these who gathered there. So these are the two examples. One, you come to the Lord's table, you have fellowship with the Lord. And others who worship the Lord. Uh, You come to some, some setting like this, and you sit down and you participate, you're also going to have fellowship. You're going to have fellowship with demons and with Satan and with other foul, rank, carnal, defiled people. So, look at verse 19. What do I mean then? Paul anticipates our question. So, Paul, what are you trying to say? So, Paul, what, 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 are, you, what are you 
What is your point that you're trying to get across as you talk about fellowship in the Lord's Supper and fellowship in the golden calf? So Paul answers, so, so that none of us miss the point. He says that a thing sacrificed to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything, and note the question mark. Both of these questions anticipate a negative answer. Because Paul has already given us this negative answer in chapter 8, verse 4, in which he says there is no such thing as an idol in the world. And so Paul can anticipate the Corinthians, what they're thinking, Paul, why are you so worked up about idolatry? You just told us idol, an idol is nothing. It's just a block of wood. It's just a, a, a piece of stone. There are no other gods. There is only one true living God. Why are you belaboring this point to flee idolatry if idols are nothing? And so in verse 20, he, he answers the question. He says, no but... This is the answer to verse 19. No, he answers this question, no, meaning an idol is nothing, but. And when he says but, the idea is the idol is nothing, but they represent a reality from the satanic world. And standing behind these nothings are something. Standing behind these nothing idols are demon spirits who are hungry for worship, who are lusting after adoration, who long to take the place of God, and who are showing up at these pagan temples like going through a buffet line, just eating up the worship that is being offered to these idols, and in fact are the instigators of this whole foul system so that they will receive this worship. So he says it in verse 20, No but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, talking about these pagan Gentiles in pagan temples as they celebrate their pagan feasts with pagan sacrifices. No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice... Now, watch the end of verse 20. This is not me, this is Paul. This is not Paul, this is God. They sacrifice to demons. And as they sacrifice to demons, there is a connection with demons. There is a connecting point with demons. There is a touching of demons and a flirting with demons and a playing with demons. They sacrifice to demons. And the implication is, and so are you Corinthians. It's not just them, it's you. When you go into these pagan temples, and when you participate in their foul, false worship, you are sacrificing to demons. And you are baiting them, and you are enticing them, and you are opening yourself up to them and he says, these sacrifices, no matter how sincere you are, are not to God, capital G. They are to demons. 
He says at the end of verse 20, and I do not want you to become sharers in demons. I do not believe that a true believer can be demon-possessed as such, but a believer can be a sharer in demons. He can come under the influence of demons. He can commune with demons. He can be a partner with demons. And that is exactly what Paul is saying here. And the greatest danger to their soul is not that they are having fellowship with these other pagans. The greatest danger is that they are having fellowship with the kingdom of darkness and with the demons who are standing behind these pagan worship services. These are not mere casual social occasions. These are not just getting together with other people in a, in a religious, somewhat quasi-religious setting that has a lot of social and a lot of cultural thrown in. These are direct encounters with Satan. They are opening themselves up to demonic attacks. Again, Satan has longed to be worshipped. You remember when Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights? You remember the second of the last temptations that were thrown at him? The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Let me tell you, if he took on the Son of Man, he's going to take on you, he's going to take on me. It's an argument from the greater to the lesser. It's what Satan is after. We as Christians are not immune to the influence of demons. And I wonder sometimes in our counseling and in our parenting and in our relationships with one another at times, we are not aware that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. That the conflict goes way beyond the natural to the supernatural. Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. As Peter had become a mouthpiece for the devil himself. Peter later would say to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And on and on we could go. Their power is great in opposing us. Demons can cause us to be active and to bring influence, to resist God's will, to lie against God, to... Uh, to suffer persecution, to be stunted in our spiritual growth, to be tempted in immorality, and to prevent us from moving forward in our ministry and in our service for God. Paul himself said to the, Thessalonic to the Thessalonians, I've tried to come to your town, I've tried to come to your church and to your city, but Satan has prevented me, Satan has, has thwarted me. It is a very real danger. And Paul's point is, why are you even putting your toe into that part of the, of the lake? You need to flee. You need to get away. Note third, the contradiction of idolatry in verse 21. It, Paul puts it in this way, it's an either or, it's not a both and. You're going to have to make up your mind which world you're going to live in. He says in verse 21, you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. The two are mutually exclusive. These two realms are diametrically opposed to one another. They are two kingdoms in conflict. This is a total impossibility. They are totally incompatible with each other. You cannot take of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't have it both ways. And this is not to say that they would lose their salvation, but that they would lose those things that are precious to their salvation. They would be disqualified from ministry 
Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, they would be benched, booted, and disqualified in the Christian life if they continue this nonsense of trying to be in these places where they must not be. Then he says, you cannot partake of the Lord, or partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, but you can't love both. And you're sure not acting like you hate this one as you're going there. Later, Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? The answer to every one of those questions is nothing. Absolutely nothing as it relates to the redemptive kingdom of God. So finally, the condemnation of idolatry, verse 22. And we conclude. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? The answer to that is yes. You do provoke the Lord to jealousy. He claims exclusive love, loyalty, and allegiance from every one of us. And when we want to flirt with the world and play with this, with this other stuff, it provokes the fire of His love, which cannot be twinch, quenched by many waters. Jealousy is connected to God's holiness. God is not a stoic. God feels very deeply towards us. And He will have no competitive lovers in our lives. That's why he says, do not love the world nor the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from God and is passing away. So we do provoke the Lord to jealousy, and it brings his chastening. In fact, this heading could be the chastening of idolatry. It invites his chastening. Then he says, are we, not, are we not stronger than he? Are we? We are not stronger than he, are we? The answer to that is no. God is much stronger than we are. God will, God will not allow this idolatry to go unpunished. And let me just tell you, in the next chapter we'll study it. When the Corinthians were coming to the Lord's table, God was taking them out. God was killing them. They were dying. They were committing sins unto death. And they were dying, from a human perspective, a premature death. And Paul will say, as they come to the Lord's table, you're trying to go into those pagan temples and sit down before those pagan gods and have those meals, and then you come back over to church and you sit down for the Lord's table and you act so sanctimonious as if everything is all right with your life. After you've heard Paul say, flee from immorality and flee from idolatry, do you think God is not provoked with jealousy? Do you think you're stronger than God that you can resist his chastening hand? Paul will tell them in the next chapter, that is why many of you are sick and in bed and why others of you sleep, meaning they have died the death of a believer because you come to the Lord's table trying to court the devil himself. So he says, you need to flee this. You need to get up and run. You need to run as far away from those places as you possibly can unless you are trying to evangelistically take everyone for Christ in a clear, open presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I bring this to close, there's so much more swir swirling in my head that I want to say. But let me just put it this way. There's only two sides in this. This is not complicated, it's very simple. There's God's side, there's the devil's side. Choose you this day whom you will serve. 
As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What about your house? What about you? And if God be God, then serve God. If Baal be God, then serve Baal. But if you're going to serve the Lord and name the Lord as your God, then for God's sake, get out of these other places and come stand with the Lord and have fellowship with Christ when the church comes and gathers for the Lord's table. And get out of these other idolatrous, pagan hell holes and come back and be singular in your allegiance and singular in your devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Declare sides and live it. That's what Paul is saying in these verses. Believe me, this is probably the last, these are the last verses I would have picked to choose this morning, except we're going verse by verse through Corinthians. But I believe that all Scripture is profitable. And there is much that God has delivered to the front doorstep of your heart and your life today. Much. And much for us to respond to. If you've never believed in Jesus Christ, if you've never committed your life to Him, then this moment, this hour, this second, flee to Christ. Flee from your sin. Flee from the world. This world is going to hell. You know that. Jump ship. Flee to Christ. Believe in Him. Entrust your soul to Him. And He will save you. And you will never perish. Let us pray. Father in heaven, blow a trumpet in our ears. Arouse us, call us to arms, call us to action. May we not be asleep in Zion. May we stand up and may we serve the one true living God.